thankful. You know, it's, it's amazing. Most of the time, my most memorable, favorite trips are the ones that God changes the plans. Because God knows what he's doing. Sometimes I go on trips and I'm not really doing what God wants. I'm doing spiritual things, but not necessarily what God wants. But when God does what he wants, and then we just say, yes, sir, a lot of times it's very blessed. So again, we would not have met y'all, and uh, it, it would have been sad because I have enjoyed it greatly. And so I, I also have a special gift I want to give to the college and to the church here. And I hope that it will be a blessing to be used for the sake of the gospel and for the ministry. Uh, what it is, is it's a, it's a PA system. And this PA system can be used portably. So you can use it over in different markets or you can use it in different areas. But it has the ability to be very loud. As you can tell, it's sometimes louder than some of the PAs in America. But the other neat thing is that you can be able to put a USB and then that way you can even play music. And uh, even you can hook your phone up here and you can play music through here. So while the group is going out and they're singing, uh, maybe there's a church that doesn't have a piano or they don't have electricity, well now you have electricity because you can charge it like a battery and then uh, you're ready to go. So you plug it in and then you can sing, you push play and then you can sing with the deal. So I hope it's a blessing. It's from our heart. I know it's not much, but it is, uh, it's always much, little is much when God is in it. Amen. So thank you for that. And so Dr. Uh, Victor, this is for you. And uh, we're very blessed to be here. Thank you. And then I'll give you the box, box with the charger. Now this one maybe does not work here, but it you can use any of the, the, the heads. So, Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Let us go. All right. Let me get my laptop. I uh, I was running a little late because I wanted to. Uh, it's brand new. I've never. I just opened it. So when I went to play with it uh, the other day. Uh, it was not it was not charged, so I had to put a little bit of some charge in it so I could show you how it worked. So let me let me get going. Go with me to uh, Romans. We're back in Romans, right? Back in Romans. Now we talked about the end of Acts. Now we're in Romans. This is the letter that Paul wrote. Um, and uh, let me get there. Now, 
It's a blessing because in India we have led all the monkeys to the Lord. And everyone is going to heaven. And next year, Brother Sam said that he's going to have baptismal service. And they may even join, they may even join the seminary here. So you better be careful because they may get better grades than you get. So make sure you do good grades. All right. So let's go back to uh, Romans. And uh, for a little bit of a summary, again, we're going uh, point by point to explain who all Paul is trying to uh, address and get on to right now. And uh, we see the first group of people that he gets on to uh, is the uh, unjust, the unrighteous. These are the ones that break God's law. And we talked about each and every one. We spent three hours going through three verses. Just three verses. We spent three hours. One hour per verse. Uh, not many preachers I know will be able to do that. And it's because many times we read quickly over the Word of God, and the Word of God is powerful. It has so much truth, even in one word. So we watched about how disobedient to your parents is unrighteousness. We, we read how covetousness, pride, like my wife, remember, she likes to win and make fun of people when she loses and says, ha, 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 I'm the best at board games. And then uh, a haughty or a boasting, all these things are not good. And because they're not good, they produce inside of us sin. And God says, because of that sin, you deserve God's wrath. Okay? Then we see a second group. The second group was the moral people. These are the people that say, I've done nothing wrong. Everything you just said, everything I have done properly. And God says, okay, well, there's one thing you have done wrong. Because you judge people. The only reason why you do good is because you show off. You want everybody to be so proud of you. Look at what I did. I'm such a good student. Aren't you glad that I cleaned the room without even asking? I'm just the best. And uh, the Bible says that many times we do that, not because of Jesus. We do it because we want to be better. And God says, no, 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 that's the same. Just because you do no sin doesn't mean that you don't have God's wrath on you as well. And then we move to the next people. These are the elect or the chosen. And these are the Jews. These are the ones that uh, sit down in a chair and they say, oh, I don't have to worry about anything because I'm God's child. I'm God's child. I can sin. I can fornicate. I can be bad. It was no problem because I am God's child. I am better than you. And Paul said, no, you're not better. And also you need to understand if you're my child, I will punish you harder. I'll punish you harder than those that do not understand. You remember I told you yesterday about my two children. And if I tell one child, go clean your room, and I forget to tell the other one, they already both know they're supposed to clean their room. So if I forget to tell one, and when I go and look, and they don't clean their room, and I get on to this one, and then my daughter Brooklyn says, but you did not tell me to clean my room. No, but you already know you're supposed to clean your room. Remember? That's what God was saying, because the Gentiles would say, God, you did not give us the laws of Moses. That was just for the Jews. And God said, no, but I gave you the law in your heart. You know that it's wrong to kill people. Even the Nagas, many, many generations ago, knew it was wrong to kill people. They knew that. The Bible says that there is no one without excuse, because God says God is not a respecter of persons. So let's continue on. We were in uh, uh, Romans chapter 2. And let's read there verse number, uh, uh, let's read verse number 20, let's read chapter 3, verse number 1. Let's go ahead and move on. So again, we're still talking about the Jews, and God's trying to straighten the Jews. Paul's trying to explain to the Jews, Jews, listen to me. I know you're a child of God on earth, but if you do not get saved, and if you do not get your heart clean, and receive Jesus, you will not be a child of God in heaven. Are you listening? Remember what the Bible says? There will be preachers that stand before God and say, God, I did miracles in your name. And God will say, I never knew you. You weren't one of my children in heaven. Your name's not written in the book of life. And so we need to be mindful of that with the Jews. Because he's saying to the Jews, listen Jews, just because you're God's son here doesn't mean you're going to be God's child up there. The Bible says, no man cometh to the Father but by Jesus. And look at verse 1 then. So then somebody asked Paul this question, so that's why he wrote it down. And this is the question that the person asked. 
uh, somebody, the Jew, asked Paul, said, well, then what advantage is it to be a Jew? You see, now the Jew is upset. And he says, well, if I'm not the best, then why do I need to even be a Jew? You know, I see that in America a lot with Christians. I see Christians walk around and they think they're better than everyone and I'm God's son and I'm, I'm so holy. And then when you read the scriptures, and that's why pastors, preachers, future preachers, when you get behind the pulpit, you need to preach the word of God. You don't need to preach opinions. You do not need to preach what they want to hear. You preach what God tells them. Because the Bible says that we are supposed to follow truth. And the truth says, just because you go to church does not mean you're righteous. Does not mean you're righteous at all. And so when a preacher gets behind a pulpit and starts saying, get right with God, get right with God, get right with God, what starts happening is a person in the heart that's a Christian that has a bad heart begins to get upset and says, well, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. We have many of those happening in America. I am leaving the Christians. I am getting unbaptized. I am renouncing God. God is not real. They are giving up because they never wanted. Remember what Jesus said? They left us because they never were one of us. You can't be one of us and leave us. You can't say, I love you, and then say, I hate you. Because the Bible says love is God. God loves. He never hates. So for you to say, oh, Dr. Victor made me upset. Oh, this college made me upset, so I'm not going to church anymore. I'm done then you did not understand what the Bible is trying to teach you. The Bible is trying to teach you to have mercy. The Bible is trying to teach you to keep your heart clean, keep your heart humble. Are you going to have things happen? Sure you are. Did you know? Let me tell you a secret. I went to Bible college in America, and guess what? Even the Bible colleges in America sometimes did things that was wrong to me, that I did not like. Even when I was in Bible college, I used to say, I wish I could have this. And they promised me to have this kind of food, and they did not give me this kind of food. And I wish I had this, and so I'm very upset. But guess what? If I continue to dwell on that, then I am before long not even going to believe and love God. Because it's, you, you listen to me, listen to me well. We know all things work together for good to them that love God. But if you don't love God, then things aren't going to be good. That I didn't say it's going to be easy. I said good. Sometimes the hard things are the best things. Exercising is not easy. It's not fun. But it's the best. Because exercise gives you more strength. You see? And it's the same way. God, whatever is going in your life right now that you are upset with, God knows it. So trust Him. God knows what He's doing. You know, if you trust Him, He may give you what you have in your heart. If you're not going to trust him, I'm not going to give my son something if he's pouting because I don't like that kind of spirit. But if my son is very merciful to me, then I may give him something. So we see here the Jew said, well, what good is it to be a Jew? I don't even want to be a Jew then. I want to go in the world and fornicate and be bad and murder and steal and do all these wicked things because what good is it? Well, listen to what he says. He says, or well, what profit is there at circumcision? Why? Why be a Jew? Read verse number two. Paul answers the question. He says, much of every way. He said, listen, wait a second. Don't forget all the blessings you have. Many times what we do is we focus on one bad thing and we forget about all the good things. It's every time. Do you know it's called in America the missing tile syndrome? If this uh, church was able to have the money to be able to put a nice tile on the floor. And it was the beautiful, it was the best. It was from Taj Mahal, very beautiful. But then we left one little corner missing. You know what people would do when they would come down? They would not say, oh, the tile is very blessed. What they would say is, what's wrong with this over here? And yet you have 99 pieces of tile that are good, but uh, who cares about the 99 pieces of tile that are good? Let's focus on the one tile that's bad. That's why your heart is so miserable. Because you forget all the things that God has done in your life. Look at what God's saying here. God says, wait a second, much every way. 
Here's one of the good things. All you think about is the law. That's all you care about. It's not fair. I don't get to do what I want to do. Well, but look, because you're a Jew, look at the verse. It says, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Listen, because you were a Jew, everyone now knows truth. Is that bad? Oh, I hate being in church. I'm tired of the rules. I just want to leave. If it wasn't for church, you'd be going to hell. If it wasn't for church, people in the world would be going to hell. Is that bad? No, oh, that's good. But we look at the one problem rather than all the blessings. Paul said, no, no, no. Everybody that worships Moses and Abraham and say, wow, these are great men. They came from the Jews. Why would you want to leave that? Why would you want to leave that? Many of you are from the Nagas. And we all know of the great missionary William Pettigrew that came there. And I tell you, if William Pantigrew had put his hands down and said, God, it's not fair. All the other Korean missionaries get to eat nice food, and I have to eat this tribal food. So I'm so very upset, you know, maybe you would not have been, you would be still going to hell today. But he was not interested in the negative, he was interested in the positive. He wanted to be blessed, and he wanted others to be blessed. And so Paul said, don't give up your history. Don't give up your heritage. Don't give up what God has given you and run to something that God has not given you. It's just like a girl in America. Again, it's no different, India and America. Here's a young girl that becomes young adult, and now they're interested in the boys. And the parents are telling them, no, 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 I don't like this boy. There's something wrong with this boy. And you get upset. And you say, but I like this boy. And so you run away from your family and you go with this boy. And you know, it's funny, you gave up everything that your parents gave you for a boy you don't even know. You see, that boy could lie to you and lie to you and lie to you. And then you're with this boy and you're so glad and you don't talk to your family no more because they're so mean to you. And then five, six years later, this boy runs off with another girl and you're left with children and you're weeping. Because you said, oh, I should have listened. Because it's not about what I think. You know the things we get upset about? The things we get upset about is such a short time. You know, sometimes we, we enjoy the food, yeah? And then sometimes the food is not the best. Like it gets cooked bad. Like maybe too hard, maybe not cooked enough. And so then we say, oh, this is not the best. You know what they teach in the military in America? Well, it will pass. It will pass. The, this meal will go away, and the next meal will come, and it will be a better meal. It's okay. But you know what a lot of people do? A lot of people say, this is it. I've had enough. And then they get upset, and they change their whole life over something that is just for one day. It's just one day, and they'll be gone. So many, so many girls in America are saying, I want married, I want married, I want married, and there's nothing wrong with that. But then the mom and the dad say, I don't know if you should go there. I don't know if you should be with that boy. I need to be married. There's no other boy that will want me. No, no, there is. Because God has prepared one. You just have to wait. But I may be 60. It'll be okay. God knows what he's doing. Guess what? I have a good friend. He is in the ministry. He's a, a, a preacher. And he's a great singer. I wish you could hear his voice. A great singer. Do you know he just got married recently? He has never touched a woman before. He has never fornicated. He has never kissed a girl. He got married recently and he's 50. 50. A lot of people say, oh, he can't have kids. So miserable. You know what? He's so happy. He's running around and he's going with her and he's showing her around. And you know, I've seen 20. 25, 30 year olds that get married and they're not happy at all. You know why? Because they focus on the little thing rather than the big thing. God has been good to us. Paul said, wait, 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 wait. Just because you see the Gentiles now, the Gentiles are blessed and now you're jealous? Why are you jealous? You've had everything. Remember the prodigal son? The prodigal son left and then the prodigal son came back. I have a message on this. When the prodigal son came back, he was given what? A robe. The robe is a picture of salvation. It's a picture of salvation. He was also given a ring. What is the ring a picture of? Salvation. He was given a meal. What is that a picture of? Being fed. 
being complete. There is no one else that you need other than God the Father and Jesus Christ. You need nothing else. And you know what the older boy out in the field did? He says, it's not fair. It's not fair. This boy's wicked. He's wicked boy, naughty boy. And he comes back and they give him feast. And remember what the dad said? The dad said, everything that I have is yours. Everything. And he said, guess what? You know what he was saying? You know, I gave your son, I gave your brother the robe. Guess what? The older brother, the Bible says, the older brother had a robe. He just wouldn't put it on because he didn't want to wear it. You see, what Paul's saying here is, Jews, listen, God, you're God's children. Why would you want to leave? Why? You have the robe. Just put it on. Don't get jealous of them. Put it on. Remember what Jesus said? When a man goes out into the field and it's in the morning and he pays somebody for one day's wage, and then it's almost now sundown and he's running out of time, so he gets another man and he pays him one day's wage, and then the first man gets upset. Why does he get the same money I get? What does it matter to you? You were happy when you agreed to get the wage. Why are you now mad? We, I've seen that a lot. I've seen people try to sell something. And they say, oh, I have this cell phone, and I'll sell it to you for 8,000 rupee. And you say, oh, that's a pretty good deal. It's brand new. And so you say, okay, I'll buy it. And they see, oh, I sold it too low. So they say, oh, never mind, 12,000 rupee. Why are you so jealous? Why are you so greedy? You were happy with eight. Why do you want 12 now? You see, it's the same way. Paul is saying, don't be jealous because of the Gentiles. You know what is a true sign of your Christianity? Do you want to know what is a true sign of your spirituality in your heart? When somebody gets an award, you're happy, not jealous. You're excited, not sad. You should be happy when somebody gets something. You should be happy when somebody gets some money, when somebody gets new shoes, when somebody gets new clothes. You should be excited for them, not upset at them. Paul said, wait, this is, don't give up your heritage. Listen, guys, don't give up your church, your Christian. Don't give it up because of one little thing. God is putting you through the fire so that he can make you a better person, so he can make you a holier person. Let's look at verse number three. So Paul's still talking, and Paul says here, he says, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God, verse number three, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? So he's saying here, wait a second. Hold on, don't get upset. You've got the truth. You've got the word of the law. You've got the Bible. Why are you upset? Because verse 3, For what if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Just because somebody doesn't believe, does that mean you need to give up too? You know, a lot of people leave church because somebody else leaves church. Remember Peter? Peter got upset with God. He denied Jesus. And then Jesus told him, said, you're going to deny me. And when he denied Jesus, his heart got sad. And what did the Bible say? He said, I go fishing. I'm tired. I'm going to go back to fishing. And what did the Bible say? It said other people went with him. And what Paul, Paul is saying here is, wait, just because you see the good in Muslim or Hindu or money or the world doesn't mean it's good. Look at what it says. For what if some did not believe? Just because they don't believe doesn't make it now, doesn't make their unbelief make the faith of God not worthless. What he's saying here is if you know somebody that's being successful and prosperous and they don't believe in God, that doesn't mean that it's not true. I, I don't like Christians anymore. I'm not a Christian no more. I'm not going to be in the church no more. And they leave and you watch their lives and now they're successful and now they look happy. And you say, well, maybe Christian is no longer true. I don't know. It is true. It is true. You know, remember what David said in Psalms. David said, God, why do you let the wicked ones, the naughty boys, the ones that do not believe in you, why do you let them have money? Why do you let them have treasures? I'm your servant and I get little, very little. And then the wicked get so much riches. You know, God answered. You know what he says? God says, God says, I'm a just God. You know this person that has lots of money? He'll be in hell forever. God wants him to at least enjoy the world. You see? It's like he doesn't, God does not want people to be miserable. 
You're upset because you don't have millions of dollars, but God's going to give you a mansion in heaven. This man has millions of dollars, but he's going to live in hell forever. So don't be discouraged. Just, just pray for them and ask God to change their heart. Maybe if you pray for them, maybe if you will work in their lives, God may bring him your way. You know what I like about our pastor in Texas? Our pastor is not scared to talk to politicians. He's not scared to talk to rich people, to poor people, to fancy people. He will talk to anyone. And guess what? Because he will talk to anyone and everyone, there have been rich people that have gotten saved, and then they come into his life and they say, Pastor Wells, I want to use my money to be a blessing. And our pastor has been able to travel around the world because he was in he loved people that other people, oh, I'm scared. I don't want to talk to the politician. He's not scared to talk to the politician. And so now the politician's excited. He's happy because he got saved. And he said, why did you talk to me? No other Christian wanted to talk to me. And because I'm thankful, I want to give you some of my treasures. And he's been able to fly on airplanes. See, that's what I'm saying. Remember what the Bible says? They were complaining and they said, how are we supposed to pay Caesar? You want us, Jesus, to follow you, but we have to work. How can we? And what did he say? He said, go out fishing. And in the fish, you're going to find a what? A coin. And what was the coin for? To pay for your needs. But what is the fish a picture of? It's a picture of soul winning. It's a picture of getting somebody saved. The Bible says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. You go love people, you tell them about Jesus, they get saved, they become a Christian, and then out of their mouth will come money to be able to help you in the ministry. But we don't care about that. We just want God to give it to us like this. God, just give me the money. No, 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 no. God says, no, you do what you're supposed to do, and then I will bless. God does not bless laziness. God blesses hard work and obedience. So we continue. It says in verse number four. So he says, so if some people don't believe, does that mean their their this disbelief makes God now not real? I don't believe in God, so now he's not real. Verse four says, God forbid. Absolutely not. God is God, whether you believe or not. I don't care if everybody in here says I don't believe. I don't care if America, the military, says I don't believe in God. When God comes back, God's going to reign. When God comes back, he's going to be powerful. Nothing will be able to stop him. Not the devil, nothing. I don't believe in you, God. Okay, you cannot believe in me. You notice in Genesis, think about this. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know what humans do a lot of times? A lot of times humans will say something, and then they try to convince you to be on their side. Like, for instance, I may say, hey, I am an American, and I love people, but I don't see that your faces are happy, so I say, well, let me explain, let me show you how I love people. I love people because I do this. We try to convince people to believe us. Please believe me, because I I want you to be my friend. Do you know in Genesis, God does not do that? God says, in the beginning, I created the heaven and the earth. You believe me, or you don't. You don't want to believe me? Go away. You're fine. I don't need you. And then he moves on. Because he's not insecure. He doesn't have to. He doesn't care what you think. Because God knows who he is. The only people in the world that are worried about people are people that don't know who they are. Oh, I'm so worried about my, what my friend will think. Why are you worried about what your friend will think if you know what you're doing is right? If you know what you're doing is pleasing God, then why does it matter if they are upset? It should not matter, except for the fact that you may not think or know that it is pleasing God. So we need to always be mindful of this truth. Just because someone says, I don't believe in God, God forbid, that doesn't matter. Who cares? Don't get jealous because somebody says, I don't believe in God, and they're successful. That does not make the truth no longer true. Let's read it. God forbid. Yeah, let God be true, but every man a liar. Why? Because as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy saints and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness come in the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man, God forbid. Now these are all wordy words. Like these are even hard words for Americans. 
So again, we have to take it slowly to understand. Many Americans don't even know what Paul's talking about here because they don't sit down and listen to what he's saying. Let's read it again. But if our unrighteousness commends or gives, the Bible says, but God commended his love or God gave his love. So let's look at it. If our unrighteousness gives the righteousness of God, what shall we say? So if, listen, if you're a Christian and you're walking around unrighteous, is that going to show or give others the opportunity to see a holy God? What does it say? It says, is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man, God forbid, no. Just because, listen, he's trying to show you both sides. Don't give up on your Christianity. Don't say, I don't want to be a Christian no more. I'm tired of it because I want all the money. Don't do that. But also, but also, don't say that you're a Christian and walk around wicked because it will hurt the world. The world will say, I don't want that. You know, in America, many Americans say they're Christian, but they don't act Christian. And so when COVID, when COVID took place, our government in America said, no more churches can assemble because it's, because it's dangerous. So you have to shut down. But guess what? Did you know our government did not shut down the hospitals? Did you know our government did not shut down the police stations? They did not shut down a lot of the restaurants. And some of the restaurants have more people than the churches. So why did they shut the church down? You know why they said this? This is what they said. Because the church is not important. But let me ask you a question. Why do you think that they thought the church is not important? Because the Christians didn't look like it was important. You see, the Christians were no different. Many of the Christians don't go to church on Sunday. The world doesn't go to church on Sunday. Many of the Christians lie. The world lies. Many of the Christians get mad and they curse and they drink and they smoke and the world smokes. So why? Why go to church if it doesn't change anything? It's not important. You know what it should have been? If we were living righteous and holy like we're supposed to be, what the government would have said, they would have said this is very important because this is a spiritual hospital. But they did not even think it was a spiritual hospital. They thought church was just a gathering place for people to look important and to say, I am better because I am God's children. And that's sad. And you say, well, the government doesn't ever want to believe in Jesus. That's not true. The pilgrims, when they were coming to America, they stopped in a country called uh, 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 the Tulips, Holland. And the government of Holland, they saw the Christians and they said, oh, the Christians are such good people that we need to make them the governors and the presidents of our country. And you know what the people said before they left the pilgrims? The pilgrims said, no, 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 no. We cannot make... Christianity a religion. You cannot have, you cannot make your relationship with Jesus Christ a religion because once it becomes a religion, it becomes corrupt. I am not a Christian to get saved. I am a follower of Jesus Christ to get saved. There's many Christians that claim the name of Christ, but they don't even know who Christ is. The Bible says they deny the power of God. Because they don't even know where the power comes from. If we want to be that type of person, then don't get discouraged. Don't say, I want to give up on God, but also don't say that I'm going to live wicked. Let's read the next verse. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? Listen, what God says is, no, don't live wicked as a Christian, because if you live wicked and you're saved, right? I am saved. How do I know I'm saved? Because the Bible says that if I will call at Christ to pay for my sin, that he will pay for it. Just like the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross said, will you remember me? And Jesus said, today you're going to heaven. He's not a respecter. If he'll do it to him, he'll do it for me. I asked Jesus to save my soul and to pay for my sin. So I'm going to heaven. I go without a doubt. Once saved, always saved. I could lie. I could fornicate. I could cheat. I could steal. I could murder. I could kill myself. And I'm still going. But God says, God forbid. Paul says, don't do it. 
Because if you do that, then how can God get on to those over here that cheat and steal and fornicate and lie? Why should they go to hell when you go to heaven? Well, because I asked Jesus, so? You made them go to hell because they didn't know who Jesus was. It's okay to make mistakes as a child of God, but it's not okay to live in sin because now I can. Now I'm God's son. Who cares if I do wrong? I'll still go to heaven. That's not what it's supposed to be. We got saved so that we could do good. Before I got saved, I could do no good. In my flesh, there's nothing but wickedness. God sees my righteousness, the Bible says, as filthy rags. But when I got saved, the Holy Spirit came in. God saved me so that I could live for Him, not so that I could live for me. God says, why would you want to look wicked? Because these people over here, they're going to see you and they're going to say, well, it must be okay. You know, a lot of people drink today because they see Christians drink. Well, if the Christian can do it, then I can do it. Remember when you were a child and you would tell mommy, mommy, can I have this candy? And mommy would say no. But Johnny has the candy. That's what he's saying. Paul said, why can you be wicked? It's going to hurt them. The world is going to say, but, but God, your children were just as wicked as me. These people in the world, the Muslims and the Hindus, that have not got saved, they'll stand before God and God says, you must go to hell. And they'll say, why? Because you did not believe in Jesus Christ. But your people were wicked. Why should they go to hell? Well, because they believed on Jesus. But they were still wicked, right? So don't live that confusion in people's minds. If you're a child of God, then live like a child of God. That's what the Bible is saying here. So let's, let's keep reading here. The Bible says, God forbid. Forbid how shall God judge the world? Verse 7. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we by slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come whose damnation is just. So I want to keep going because I want to make sure I get the rest of this in. So we see here the first group of people was the lawless. Okay, that's the people that do not believe in obeying the laws of God. The second group of people were the people that think, I obey them. I'm a good person. Yeah, yeah, but you're also a very nasty person. You condemn other people. You think you're better than that's That's bad too. Then we see a group of people that are these that are the children of God. We're special. And Paul said, you're special, but you're also still going to have wrath if you don't receive Jesus. And even the Christians. I've been a Christian since I was a baby. You can't be a Christian if you're not a follower of Christ. I don't care if you've gone to church since you was brand new, born. If you are not a follower of Jesus, you cannot be a Christian. You can't be. The Bible says, Jesus said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And what is God's commandment? God's not talking about working. He's not talking about doing good to go to heaven. The commandment he's talking about is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you love me, obey that. Obey that. When, when I got married to my wife, I told my wife, I said, I love you. There's some other people here that are saying, I love you. And guess what? You know why I said I love you? Because in other words, what I was saying, I want you to have no one else but me. No one else. That's what God said when he said, I love you. I love you. I want you to have no one else. No one else. I don't want you to love baptism. I don't want you to love asking for forgiveness. I don't want you to love being a Christian. I want you to love me. Because no man cometh unto the Father but by me. When we got married, me and my wife, I committed to my wife that I would be for her and her only. And she committed to me that she would be for me and me only. So then why are churches teaching it? That's a picture of God in the church. Then why are churches teaching that as the church, we're the wife? Why are churches teaching that I'm supposed to be for my husband and for another man? I believe in Jesus, but also baptism. But baptism's not Jesus. That's another man. You're not supposed to love another man. You're supposed to love one man. It's a distortion of the picture. 
God says, no, no, no. I'm a jealous God. Love me and me only. The only way you can go to heaven is if you become married with Jesus. Right? When you, in your heart, cry out to God and say, God, will you be my, will you be my husband? Spiritually. Will you be the man of the marriage? Then God has a marriage, and then you're together. And that's why you cannot be separated. Remember what the Bible says? When you get saved, nothing can separate you. The Bible says when me and my wife got married, we became one flesh. Nothing can separate us. Because what God puts together, let no man asunder. The one saved, always saved. You see, it's not Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus and baptism. Jesus and repenting. Jesus and going to church. It's Jesus. Jesus promises, just like any good man, any good husband, he promises to take care of you. When I got married to my wife, this is what I told my wife. My wife was just like any other girl, a little nervous. They're all, they have the smile and they're nervous because, oh, this is my, this is my husband. I'm fixing to get married. And you know what I told my wife? I told my wife this. I said, honey, I said, I will take care of you the rest of your life. You won't have to worry about anything. You know what that's saying? It's a picture of God. God said, look, just give me your life. Give me your heart. You have to worry about nothing. I will take you to heaven. A good, good husband that still has a happy heart because they love their wife. You know what they do? They grab their wife's hand and they say, come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go have fun. Let's go play. Let's go work together. Let's go cry together in sickness and in health. In love. In everything. Let's go. Why would Jesus marry you and then say, oh, you need to stay behind? No, no, no. Once saved, always saved. That's what God's saying here. So we see here, yes, you are one of God's children, but you need to look like God's children. You need to look like, listen, when you got saved this week, many of you did. Yep. When you got saved this week, you became a child of God. That means you need to look like I don't see a brand new bride, right? And I don't see a brand new wife that gets married that says, Oh, I'm so sad I'm married. No, no, they're happy. So why do the Christians walk around so sad? You know why? Because I don't think they realize how important it is that God truly became your husband. He truly became the one that said, I'll take care of everything. You don't have to do anything because that's how much I love you. That's, you know, honestly, that's better than any book you could ever read. It's better than any movie you could ever watch. A lot of these movies, my wife will watch some of these little romance movies and she'll feel all happy. Oh, this guy, he came on a horse and he was just a cowboy and he looked so, so romantic. Well, that's Jesus. Jesus did that for you. He came and he conquered the devil and he conquered sin. And then he took you away. The Bible even, and we may get to it, but Paul talks about how we, when we first, when Adam was first born, when Adam was created, he wasn't born when he was created, Adam was with God. But then Adam didn't want to stay with God, right? He didn't love God. God loved him, but he didn't love God. So he went and he got married to another person, and that's called the devil. There's only two people you can be married to. The Bible says you cannot love God and mammon or the world. And the Bible says that Satan is the, the, the king of the world. So you either love God or you love the devil. You say, well, I love myself. That's the devil. That's the devil. Only the devil would tell you to love yourself. Because I'm telling you, loving God is way better than loving yourself. So what the Bible says, Paul says that as he, as Adam and God were supposed to be loving each other and God loved Adam, Adam didn't love God. So Adam ran off and went with the devil. But then found out that the devil, see, it's a movie. It's like a picture. We read the book like it's, like it's just a newspaper. But it's so more than a newspaper. Paul said that when Adam and Eve ran to, to the devil because they, they heard the lies and they say, this husband's better than this husband. This husband's no good. This one's better. The Bible says that they were lied to and the devil abused them and abused them and abused them and abused them. Have you ever seen a wife that's in a marriage that they're being abused and abused and abused? And you 
tell them, you don't need to live like that. But they won't leave. They won't leave. And that's what the Bible's saying. God's sitting here saying, let me take you back. Let me take you back. But you stay over there. And you're getting beat. And beat by God. Because the Bible says God is a liar. I'll give you an example. The Bible talks about our heart is wicked. Our heart is so wicked. Let's say you're at home when you're still a little child. Or, you know, you go back home. Even now. Let's say you go back home. Your mom makes a beautiful cake. So beautiful for someone's birthday. Okay? I'm going to show you what your heart does. I'm going to show you what the devil does. This beautiful cake. It's a, it's a, what, what is the cake we ate? The, uh, uh, what's that cake right we ate that's famous here? Black Forest. Black Forest cake. How many of you like a Black Forest cake? You see the, the chocolate with the cherries on top, but she forgot the cherries. So she tells you you're at home and she tells you, listen, don't touch the cake. I've got to go to the market and get some cherries so I can put it on top. And so she leaves. And you're standing there. And you smell the cake. And you see the cake. And you look at all that frosting. It's so thick on top. So you get to thinking, what if I take a spoon and I just scrape a little bit off and then I spread it back? Mom won't even know, right? So you get a little bit and you eat it. And the whole time, the devil's lying to you. The devil's saying, nobody will know. Nobody will know. Nobody will know. But the second you eat it, Satan switches on you and says, I got you. So now, mama gets back, and you thought it was going to be happy. Oh, man, just take a bite. I'm going to be so, it's going to feel so good. Woo, that's some good chocolate. And what does the Bible say? Sin is pleasant for a season. Because the second you finish eating it, now you feel miserable. You're in the room, and your mom says, Hey! And you think, uh-oh. Oh, my God. She says, come here. Yes, ma'am. Can you go take this trash out? And you go back into your room. Hey! Oh, man. God said, you left me. You had happiness. You had peace. I was a good husband. You ran over with this man because this man said, I'll make you a better, better husband. I'll love you more. And you said, okay, I'll go with this man. And the second you went with him, he became an abuser. He beats you and he beats you and he lies and he accuses. And he says, you're wicked. How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? That's what Satan does. And all in the world, that's why they go and pray to the Hindu gods. God, dear, uh, 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 Allah, please save me. Uh, Vishnu, please save me. Uh, Muhammad, Gandhi, please cry out to the gods and save me. Why? Because the devil is lying to them. The devil is telling them, I got you, and you will for the rest of your life be miserable. Do you know some men, I don't know why, but some men are wicked like that. They like to torture people. That's the devil. The devil said, come over here. It's so beautiful over here. And you did. All of us did. All of us. But then the Bible says God made a way for us to come back. And God said, guess what? Before Jesus, divorce was not allowed. Remember, listen, I'm showing you. See, Jesus said, why? You're, you're, so, you're so selfish people. When you get to heaven, none of us will be married None of us will be married. Marriage is a picture of God. The, 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 the men in the Bible said, when we get to heaven, uh, I have two wives. Which one's going to be my real wife? And Jesus said, you're not going to have any because all you're going to be doing is thinking about me. I'm special, not you. Right? Marriage is not about us. It's about Jesus. And so here's Jesus. Listen, remember before, before, Divorce was not allowed. But then what did Jesus say later on? He said, okay, no, divorce is allowed, but this is the only, listen, it's powerful, this is the only reason why divorce is allowed. Divorce is allowed if you catch your husband cheating, lying, going against you. It's a picture of the devil. Before Jesus came, we could not leave the devil because we were married to the devil. Are you listening? But when Jesus came, it created a new law to where if your husband over here is not a good husband, 
then I can leave him properly and go to another husband. That's what the Bible says. It's a picture. God knew. I can't. I can't. That because think think with me for a second. If you're married to God, you're not allowed to separate God. We left God, and God said, "Well, I'm not just because you left me. I'm not going to let you break the law." So He had to bring Jesus down to allow the opportunity for us to come back to Him. It's a powerful picture. Is what God's saying here in this passage. So now let's go to the fourth set. So the fourth set here is the last one is towards the world. Now what he wants to do at the last portion is say, for anybody else that I miss, anybody else, which I don't know how you can miss anybody else, unrighteous and righteous, that's everybody. The, uh, the Jews, the Gentiles. But he said, just in case, listen, just in case I miss somebody, I miss somebody. You know, sometimes we're taking account and we miss somebody. Just in case I miss somebody, I want to make sure everybody knows that everyone, everyone in the world deserves hell. Let's look at verse number 9. The Bible says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have been proved before Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. So now he's saying, the Jews are saying, So what then? Are we better than the Gentiles? And Paul said, No, listen, please. You're the same. You're the same. Quit worrying about each other and worry about yourself. Verse number 10. Because as it is written, there is none, none righteous. No, not one. Not a single person is righteous. Jew, Gentile. Righteous, unrighteous. Moral, immoral. There is none righteous. No, not one. Look at verse number 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That's why it's our job as Christians to go tell people about our husband, about Jesus, about our good, good father, not the bad father. Many times we will go into the world and we'll talk about cricket and we'll talk about fun things. And that's not bad, but it's not good. We should be talking about good things. Hey, I was praying and, and my God answered this prayer. And they're going to say, really? You have a husband that takes care of you? You know, I when I first got married, I told my wife, I said, honey, I said, there's going to be days that we have a lot of money and there's going to be days we have no money. You know, that's, that's life. You have days of a lot and days of none. And I told my wife, I said, I want to make a vow to you. I want to be able to say that every month you have a little bit, it may not be a lot, but a little bit of money that you can use whenever you want to. Oh, she's happy. You know what? Girls like to shop, right? So my wife, she's going and she's buying this and she's buying this. And it's not a lot. It's very, very little. But you know, a lot of times us men or, you know, the family gets so busy and we've got so much bills that we forget to, you know, it's like I was telling Dr. Victor, sometimes we forget. Did you know 10 rupees given out of a heart of love is more than a million? Yes. Because it's the heart, you see. She's not happy because she's buying clothes. Because, listen, my wife has tons of clothes. How can she be happy with this one if she has all these other ones? So she's not happy because she's buying clothes. She's happy because she knows that I sacrificed and I made a way for her to be able to do this. But you know, listen, I've had so many ladies that are in our church and in the world. They come up to my wife and they say, man, you have a great husband. My, dad, my husband doesn't do that for me. Well, I'm not trying to impress them. I'm trying to provide for my wife. Do you know that's what Jesus does? When Jesus becomes your husband, he tells you, everything that I have is yours. Now, I'm not going to give it all to you at one time. Because if I give it all to you at one time, you'll get greedy and you'll forget about it. Sometimes I'll give it to you a little bit. But guess what? We should be happy. We should be running around and saying, my husband, God, my father, he gave me this. And then the world says, well, my God doesn't give me that. And they'll want, they'll want the real God. They'll want the real Savior, you see. So we keep going. The Bible says, that's why what I was saying is that's why you need to go into the world. Because the world will never get to know your, your, your Jesus. Your, the world will never get 
to know your husband, your spiritual one that saved your life, if you don't tell them? The girls in our church don't know anything about me unless my wife brags about it. If my wife walks around and says, oh, my husband made breakfast this morning. Well, then they're like, wow, I wish my husband would make breakfast, right? That's what we're supposed to be doing with God. God answered this prayer. God gave me another day. God healed my son when he was sick. God healed my friend when I was praying. And then the world says, that's a good, good God. I wish I had that God. So let's keep going. It says here, they are all gone out of the way. Everybody, Jew and Gentile. They are together, together, become unprofitable. You know why? Because the ones that are unrighteous, how can they help the righteous? They can't help the righteous. They're killing people and murdering and lying. How can they help the righteous? But the righteous are not helping the unrighteous because they're too busy walking around and saying, I'm a great person. I don't have time for you. Together, they are worthless. They're become unprofitable. There is none that do good, no, not one. Their tongue is an open sepulcher. When before you got saved, everything that came out of your mouth wasn't about Jesus, it was about you. And how great you are, and how smart you are, and how mean they are, and how ugly they are, and how they, they you don't like this person, I don't like that person. The tongue is an open sepulcher. The Bible says with their tongues, they have used deceit. They lie. They tell everybody. The Hindus tell you, oh, our God's real. They know that it's not real. They know it. On, on Facebook. So many people on Facebook lie. So many. They'll take a picture and say, look at me. Ain't I so happy? And they're, at, and they're in their beds at night wanting to kill themselves. So why are they lying? Because they have to impress you. Because they're miserable. The Hindus will tell you, oh, here's some tea. And I'm not saying they shouldn't do it. They should do it. But they're saying, here's some tea because my God's real. Here's some tea. When they go to, when they go to bed, they know it's not real. And they're miserable because what's going to happen when I die? You see, I've, I've noticed sometimes uh, Facebook, you know, it's, it, it, it teaches us, like, for instance, if I was to... Uh, Come here, right? If I come here. You know, Sam, he got to see the monkeys. He loves monkeys. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe because he is a monkey. I don't know. But he loves the monkeys. But you know what? If he was to put something on Facebook, you know he's not going to put on Facebook uh, some kind of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's not going to show a picture of a trash can in India. Why? Because it's not, it's not the best. He wants to show everybody the best. Like, my life is great, right? Because that's just who we are. And what I'm saying is in the world, that's what they're doing. They're pretending. Don't get caught up in their lies. Usually the ones that are pretending the most are usually the worst. There's some people in our church. I, I like making people laugh because I'm not a funny guy. And I know when I make people laugh, it's not because it's funny. It's because the joke, if it is a joke, what I said it's true. It, it like hits home. The other day I was in church and I was talking about um, how India could be better than America. And I was explaining, I think I already said this to you all yesterday, I was explaining how if India, India has a trash can right here, right? And yet the people put the trash right here. Trash can right here. And they put the trash right here. Makes no sense. We're going to Agra. Here is toilet, free toilet. Over here, here's a man going to bathroom. Toilet right here. Yeah. India could be very beautiful, like America. If they would not put trash here, they would put it in the trash can. But people laugh because they know that's so true. Like, that's who we are. Well, what I was saying, okay, I'll give you an example. Again, a lot of stuff that happens in America happens here. Have you ever met that new couple, that new person, that they're, they're always in the public? You know, we're, I'm joking about people that are with us, and, and I'm, I'm just joking, seriously. Uh, but there, I have seen some, this is what they do in front of people. And, and, then, and then there's, that literally, I, I'm telling you, I watch and say, I love you, I love you too. I love you, but they will only do it when they're around people. You see, why do they do it around people? Because when they're at home, 
They're, they're punching each other. They're killing each other. They're hurting each other. And because they feel so bad, they got to go out in public and say, don't we love each other? We're just the greatest family in the world. That's what the Hindus do. The Hindus go out there and say, I'm happy. Well, if you're so happy, then why are you miserable? You see, we don't need to look miserable. We need to look happy. We're not happy because we always get our way. We're happy because we have a good father. We're happy because we have a good husband. We're happy because we're saved. Sometimes we go through hard things. Me and my wife sometimes go through hard things. There's times where we can't. There's times where I give my wife some money, and the money cannot even buy a piece of candy. But it's okay. She's still happy because she knows I'm still making that commitment. You know that sometimes it means more. It's more special because when you give just the one rupee, in your mind you still can trust them because they're still trying. They may not have a lot this time. Maybe next time I can have more. And it's special in your heart. You say, God, I want the nice stuff right now. Well, God may not be able to get it to you right now. So just be thankful. Because in five years, you'll have nice stuff. Just trust Him. He knows what He's doing. God doesn't want anybody miserable. If you're His child, He loves you. And so we see, let's keep reading. The Bible says here, in verse number uh, 11, uh, their tongues are used with deceit. They tell everybody how much they love each other. I love my husband. I love my wife. But then when they're at home, they're beating each other up and yelling and fighting. They don't love each other. It's lies. Oh, I love my God. My God in Hinduism, he, he heals so many people. Yeah, uh, in America, we have these people called healers. Where they can go, oh, give me, give me, or they can like touch the head. And then amazingly, somebody with cancer now has no cancer. Right? Or like somebody's got a broken arm and they touch his arm and wow, it's better. Just instantly better. You know what happened? You know a lot of these preachers, they went bankrupt during COVID. <laughs> because they could not heal COVID people. Well, I guess their power went away. It was not good for COVID, only for everything else. Because it was fake. It was fake. It's lies. It's all lies. The, all this stuff is lies. You need to rely on the Father, not on lies. The Bible says that the poison of asps is under their lips. He's referring to the, the snake. He basically, he's wanting you to go back to Genesis and think about the story of the snake. And how he told you, if you come over here, if you'll eat the fruit, you'll be happy. Why did they eat the fruit? Because they wanted it. They wanted to taste the cake. And they thought they'd be happy. And guess what? They were miserable. Because they lost God. They lost their husband. No person leaves their married spouse uh, regret. I, I, every, every person that leaves their spouse regrets. Everyone. They may not show you. They may say, oh, I'm happy. I am so happy. No, they regret it. They regret it. It's the same way. Somebody leaves God. Somebody leaves church. I feel so much better. Why do you have to tell people if you feel so good? You don't have to tell me if you feel good. You're telling me because you don't feel good and you want me to think you feel good. You see, let's keep reading. The Bible says, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things whoever the law said, it is said it to them who are under the law. We know it was for the Jews. But look at what this says. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. I want to explain something. There are two lines in heaven, only two. You know how sometimes, so when we went to Agra, okay, the, the, the uh, nationals, you know, Indian people, they pay only 50 rupees. That's it. The foreigners, oh, we pay like 1,800 rupees. So high, so very, very high. But guess what? When we got to go in, guess what? All the nationals had to go through Indian line. Yeah. And all the foreigners got to go through special line. Well, I hope it's special. We spent lots of money, so we had special line. There's two lines in heaven. Two. The Bible says when you get to heaven, 
you can pick the line of the law. I want God to allow me to go to heaven because I'm good. And every person that gets in this line is going to go to hell. Everyone. And everyone will have a trial, just like in a court. Because they're going to say, God, I am not guilty. I am good enough to go. God said, okay, well, let's have court. So he's judge. He's going to have the accusers. He's going to have the law. He's going to have the witnesses. It's just like a court. And he's going to ask the angels. The Bible says there's angels taking account. Every person in here, an angel's writing all the things that you do. So when you stand there and you say, I'm not guilty. I deserve heaven. He's going to look to the angel and say, can you give me what he did that's wrong? He did this. He did this. He did this. He did this. And God's going to say, guilty. Guilty. And the judgment is death. And there is no other death except for hell. Then there's another one. It's called the line of grace. It's the line of Jesus. It's receiving Jesus. When you get to heaven, you're going to say, I don't want to be in this line. I know I'm a sinner. I am guilty. So I want to be in this line. Because Jesus paid for everybody and he said, if you'll go through this line. Remember the Bible says, narrow is the gate that leads to salvation. But broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many people, when they get to heaven, they're going to get, you know, in India, when we were in, India, when we were in Agra, did you know there were 12 gates for the Indian people? And there was only one gate for the foreigner. Why? Because not as many foreigners. Many Indian people. Only one gate for us. Many people are going to go through the law. I'm good. I'm good. I prayed to, to uh, some God. I was going to church. But the Bible says you on this earth have to get that out of your head and say, no, 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 I'm a sinner. I can't be good. Jesus is the only way. I have to go to Jesus. So you got to line up with Jesus. And then when God says, why should I let you into heaven? God, I'm guilty. I am not good. But your son asked me to come. Then that's when they're going to look at the book. And Jesus said, if your name's in the book, you're going to go to heaven. And remember, like I said, many of you, you, you asked him to come. Write your name today, I mean this week, while I've been here. That means you're forever saved. It's in blood. Blood can't go away. It's good news. But did you know that some people are smart people? Because they've said in church. And some people, they know that they're not good. And some people know that Jesus is the only way. So they're going to try to sneak. They're going to try to sneak in. You know what I noticed also at Agra? While we were getting in the line for the foreigner, guess what happened? I noticed there were some Indian people. And you know what the Indian people were doing? The Indian people were trying to get in the line for the, for the foreigner. You know why? It's a faster line. So they were trying to sneak, sneak in. And then they almost made it, almost all the way there. But then when the guy that had the ticket, when he went to grab the token, he said, oh, no, 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 you, you, you have to go over there. And go all the way back over there. That's the same way. There's going to be people that say, I know I'm bad. I know I'm a sinner. I cannot go this way. So I need to go over here with Jesus' line. And they're going to sneak in. Right? They don't have Jesus in their heart. They know Jesus, but they don't, they've never received Jesus. So the Bible says, remember, there's a story in the Bible that talks about the bridegrooms. I mean, the, uh, the, the bride uh, ladies. And that they, they weren't ready when Jesus came. And Jesus said, you need to be ready. You need to be ready. Because if you don't have Jesus here, if God comes back right now, you're going to hell. Because when you stand in this line, oh, I know this is the line. And I know I didn't ask Jesus to come in my heart. But maybe if I get in this line, I can go to heaven. The Bible says you'll be standing before God. And the picture is a powerful picture. God's going to say, where's your wedding gown? What do you mean, where's my wedding gown? You know you're going to get married to me. Where's your wedding gown? Well, I don't have it. Why don't you have it? Because I never got prepared. You never put it on. You never asked Jesus. You just waited. Oh, I'll wait. I'll wait. I'll wait. And then when you get to heaven, I'm going to go through Jesus. No, no, you can't go through Jesus. You have to get Jesus here. Not up there. It's too late up there. You have to ask Jesus to give you the ticket here. Otherwise, God's going to say Where's your wedding gift? Where's your wedding dress? You're not ready. You're not prepared in your heart. I don't know who you are. 
And then you'll have to, just like at Agra, with the Indian guy that kind of snuck in and wanted to get in real quick, the guy's going to say, no, 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 you have to go. And guess what? He has to go way to the back, to the bad one. So make sure it's settled in your heart. Like I said, I know many of you did this week, but guess what? If you didn't do it and you're still not saved, or if you did do it and you're still not saved, you need to fix it. Because listen, just because you raise your hand for an American, just because you raise your hand and pray, does not mean you're saved. You know, the Bible says when you get saved, you know you're saved. Because you have that peace in your heart that I am God's child. I'll make mistakes. My son knows he'll do wrong. I let my dad, my dad is still alive. I let him down. But guess what? I'm still his child. And it's the same way. So if you don't have that peace, you need to fix it. You need to ask Jesus to come in. So let's keep reading. It says here that now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them, uh, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, uh, we're going to be going to a new section. Do you want us to stop, Dr. Victor? Let's see. Yeah, we can, yep. we can stop that. Okay, and then we'll do a new section. Yeah, yeah.